Amen. Good to have everybody here this morning. Um, always is. I'll tell you what, I am very excited uh, to introduce our guest speaker this morning. I have known Russ for a very long time. Uh, Russ and I went to high school together, played the trumpet together a lot. Actually, he, we re- really first got to know each other. He gave me lessons, he gave me trumpet lessons. He was a little older than me in school. And uh, we got to where we you know, played a lot, played in churches. We competed, um, you know, in, for state honor band positions and all that kind of stuff. So our mutual love for the trumpet uh, just really over the years um, developed into a great friendship. And, um, you know, you've heard me say a lot over the years how in the moment you don't necessarily realize what God's doing. But then when you turn and you look back over your life, you see what God was doing, right? It makes more sense when you look back. And God actually used Russ in in, in quite a big way. Um, You know, me, if you look back at at Dennis in 1990, uh, I was very, very shy, very backward. Well, I'm still backward, but I I was very, very shy and could never get up in front of people. Just couldn't do it. I just shut down. Didn't want to be up in front of people um, and just wouldn't. But God, looking back at this now, it makes sense. God looked down through time and he knew that he was going to call me to be a pastor and I was going to have to be used to be in front of people. And I'll never forget, we're sitting there one day, me and Russ, and we're going over, we're having our lesson. And he said something about trying out for, for an honor band. Different school, all schools come together and, and you have uh, auditions and stuff. And, <clears throat> and I said, oh, I'm not going to do that. And he said, oh, yes, you are. And, uh, and so then... Later on, as we get into it, there's, uh, you could compete for solos and ensembles and stuff on a state level uh, where you basically worked a you know, solo out with a piano accompanist. And um, I said, oh, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And he said, oh, yes, you are. And he left, left me no choice. And that's actually what got me. I got so used to being up in front of people uh, playing the trumpet that when God called me to preach, it was no big transition to get up in front of people. You know? And so um, I, I just look back at those things, and, I, and I'm so thankful for people like that, uh, that God has placed you know, in my life, he, uh, God used him to get me out of my shell. Kind of ticked me off then, but I, but I'm glad now, I'm kind of glad now that he did it, but a lot of great memories with this guy, a lot of great memories. Some of those memories that I really kind of hope never go public. Uh, so, uh, work with me here, Duggar. Okay. <laughs> it, it's, it's a risk on my part to let a buddy from high school come up and uh, speak my pulpit, but now I'm not worried a bit. He called me here, uh, Oh, it's been a few weeks ago, had a great discussion just talking about the Lord and, and uh, what God was doing in his life. And um, I said, why don't you come and I want you to come and, and uh, speak to our church and just share what God's doing uh, in your life. So I, I'm just, I want you to help me make welcome. This guy is a U.S. Air Force veteran, uh, professional musician, NASCAR driver, business owner, motivational speaker. Uh, and I ran, out of pa- I ran out of lines on my page to talk about all the other stuff. That he had. Great guy, interesting guy, but most of all, he's a really dear, dear friend of mine. I want you to give Russ Duggar a welcome this morning. You're good, you're good, you're good. Checks in the mail, brother. Yeah, so um, what Dennis didn't tell you about me giving him lessons and teaching him whenever, whenever we were much younger is that um, I don't think it was the first competition that we went to, but he beat me. <laughs> he was first chair and I was second. So the student beat the teacher, and I had to go home and kind of reconcile with that. I was like, what did I just do? <laughs> what did I just, I had to do, I was trying to just make somebody better, not better than me. <laughs> And that was the selfish, you know, 16, 17, 18-year-old person uh, 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 talking like that. But, um, but yeah, my gosh, I could go on and on and on about the, uh, the things that he doesn't want to go public. So um, none of them are actually that bad. I mean, come on, I think we all probably all did some, some stupid stuff whenever we were younger. That's what, that's what makes us wise in our older ages is all the bad decisions or questionable decisions that we do when we're younger. Hey, I do have a, a quick question, though, for um, the assistant pastor that was up here that did it, did, how was the soup? It wasn't any good. Okay, okay. It was too smoky. Well, I was trying to figure out, did God save the church or did he save the soup? He saved the church. He saved the church. Okay, all right. Well, you didn't go over that detail and just bugging me the whole time. I'm like, okay, well, we burned a paper towel. We burned a towel. All right, so anyway. Um, oh, look at that. That's fantastic. Jennifer, can we put the other one up there? Um, so, uh, I kind of want to, I, I kind of want to go over a few things here. Um, we're, we're going to talk about one specific word, unbelievable. Okay. So whenever I was in high school, I pretty much just wanted to be a professional musician. I love race cars and love going fast, but you got to have a lot of money to go fast. I was told one time by a, by a team owner that only two people are ever going to pay for you to, to, to grab the steering wheel and it's either you or a sponsor. 
And we never had the money to do that. So I had to learn a lot about marketing and so on and so forth and a lot about myself in order to make this. This is at Bristol Motor Speedway, and that was an absolutely unbelievable experience to be there with my parents. We can go to the next one there, Jennifer. Um, I, I didn't set this up right, so her and I are going to have a conversation here. So that's my dad standing on the, the, the that's turns in the middle of turns three and four at Bristol. Um, you can go to the next one there. And then uh, what's funny is dad's taking a photo of somebody, right? He's taking a photo of me. We're standing next to each other there um, on, on, the, on the high banks. If you look at our ankles, you can kind of see how much uh, banking was there. It was my first time at Bristol, so, you know, I got the little, little schoolgirl thing going on. We can just keep rolling. I'm not going to talk very much on these, so... Uh, that's my grandfather and I. That's, uh, that's at Pitt Road. That's on Pitt Road. My father and I. No resemblance whatsoever between the two of us. Um, and then my mother, and she's here today. So that's fantastic. That's actually Daytona. Pause that one, please. Um, that's my dad signing the start finish line at Daytona. That before the race, if you know you had the pit passes or whatever, you they allow you to walk out on the racetrack and out on the trioval. And so that picture before this one was my mom and dad on the trioval, and that's my dad actually signing the start finish line. So it's kind of crazy that you saw all those signatures. Um, there's a bunch of people that go out there and they all sign that, and you don't see that on TV. And cars buzzing by, but we can keep rolling now. Let's see what the next one is here because I don't I don't remember. Oh, there's so that's my brother on the far left. We've already saw my mom and dad. That's at Kansas Speedway. We can just keep rolling, Jennifer. Um, uh, that's back at Daytona. The media made me take that photo. That was all, all awkward. That's at Daytona, the number 12 car. Unfortunately, that's me, and pretty obvious what's getting ready to happen there. Uh, yeah, everybody likes to see you crash, right? That's uh, the number 12 truck. That's me at Kansas, and again, pretty, pretty obvious how that one ended. A um, couple concussions out of that deal. Um, on this next slide, pause that one right there. So that's my front bumper after Talladega. <laughs> Anybody that's a race, do we have race fans in here? Am I just talking over everybody's head? Okay, fabulous. I, I thought, small town Missouri, come on now. You know, I grew up in Mountain Grove, we, we should be good here. So yeah, that's after, uh, after the race at Talladega. And I, the funny thing is, is I wondered why I was so good whenever I was tucked in behind a car and why I was so bad when I tried to, tried to, 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 to pull out and go around. Well, I had a parachute in my front bumper that I didn't know from, from bumping guys too hard. So now we can roll again, Jennifer. And uh, I think this next one will be, yeah, so we're going to stop on that one. I'm just going to leave that one up there. So I want you to see on the bottom right is my grandfather. He's got the headphones on. And he's high-fiving my dad, okay? My mother is a little to the left. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come over here. This picture's kind of dark, so forgive me. She's right here to the left. She's got that white visor on. You can't really tell, but she's smiling and clapping. And then on the, on the, on the scoring pylon up there, if you go down to the fifth spot, you'll see 8-0. And that was my best career finish at Talladega. We came across the finish line four wide, and uh, the leader, he was way up there. And the rest of us were four wide, and I was last of the four. Uh, but it was top five finish, and uh, that was somebody, I don't know who took that photo, but somebody captured that photo, and it just really means a lot to me. Because everything that I've shown you as an 18-year-old kid, and then in college, and then I joined the Air Force, and I'm a professional musician in the Air Force, and then uh, I get out of the Air Force, I'm actually running a hobby shop, and then I, I, I was a crew member on a Bush Grand National team as a rear tire changer, and I hated it because I wanted to be the driver. And again, I just thought that was me being selfish. And I decided one day, you know what, this itch is not going away. It's not going away. So I want to put some focus and some effort into it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray about this. And if this happens, then it's, then it's obviously meant to be. I think all of us have been that, uh, in, that, in that spot sometimes in our life. And the whole experience was absolutely unbelievable. For a kid from Mountain Grove, to do what I did, unbelievable. And that's kind of what ticks me off, is everybody says, well, Russ, that's unbelievable. What for? Why is it unbelievable? I did it. You saw me do it. I prayed for it. I knew. I felt it. I didn't have any reason to. Mom and dad didn't drive race cars. Mom and dad didn't, they didn't play trumpet. I didn't have a, like a grossly musical family, yet I, I get accepted to Juilliard. What? Now he's going to go drive race cars? So if God puts something in your heart, and you've got this calling, and you've got this, you've got this passionate presence in your life, but it's not actually a physical presence in your life, I would suggest that you listen to it. On some level, you should listen to it. And you should listen to it with intensity. Not passively and be like, oh, that's just a phase I'm going through. And then listen to the people in your life that are saying, that's just a phase he's going through. Russ, you got a good job at AutoZone. You're a store manager. 
You're making 55K a year. Would you stop this NASCAR dream crap? It's not going to happen. And then I go to Martinsville in 2008. I go to the bathroom. And I'm taking a whiz next to Dale Jr. And then I go to the NASCAR hauler to look at the, they got a big TV screen that always says the radar up. And in Martinsville, rain comes up over the mountains and it, and it can mess a person's day up. And we didn't have any points. So we had to qualify to make the race. And so I'm standing at the, at the weather monitor looking at the, at, at the weather and this person comes up and my head's somewhere else. I'm pretty stressed out. So I don't know who this person is and we're just talking about the weather. I finally look over to acknowledge who the person is and now I'm talking about the weather, Jeff Gordon. What? Now Martinsville is a small enough racetrack where you're all crammed in there. That did not happen on a normal basis. Me and Del Jr. would never share a bathroom anywhere else, trust me. Um, and, and those guys are iconic and I'm not putting myself in the same same situation with them, but there I am doing the same thing as they are. But that's unbelievable. No, it's not. As hard as I worked, as much as I sacrificed, the amount of people that I, the amount of friends that, that were no longer friends, that I had to let go in my life, the amount of people that I used to respect, but now I had to ignore because they weren't expecting my dreams and my goals. They weren't expecting my God. When I said that this is something that I pray about and I'm not, get, be, get, I'm not getting any signs that says you shouldn't do that. As a matter of fact, I'm getting the exact opposite. I'm getting signs and indicators that, yeah, you should. Yeah, you can. And oh, yes, you will. And when I get out there and I do it, crap, we're, we're kind of fast. What? We have the ability to finish fifth at Talladega. What? Talladega, I, I get it. For those of you who are asking, Talladega is a crap shoot. You're going to win or you're going to lose. You're going to crash or you're not. And if you just finish the race, you're doing well, right? So I understand that there's an asterisk next to that top five as a, as a race car driver. I, I get that. But I also understand that I, we, had, we had finished in the top 10 many times. We finished in the top 20 many times, top 15 many times. We was always on the lead lap. We were not a slow race car. Where I'm going with this is that you have the naysayers. You have the people that are in your head. And you got to get them out. And if they're in your head because they're in your life, then maybe you have to make that difficult decision to let them go. Maybe you have to make a difficult decision to not let a person go, but to let a career go. To, I don't know, let a material item go. It just doesn't serve its purpose. It doesn't make you happy anymore. It actually just creates more stress. It's, being out in the garage, working on the cars, killing your marriage. Who knows? There's all kinds of different things. People will pray for God to make an appearance in their life. God, just give me a sign that you're listening. And then the gust of wind blows and blows over the, the Buddy the Elf in the front yard that you've got put up. And you're like, oh, man, i got to go fix Buddy the Elf. Well, that was your sign. He can't blow over Mary and Joseph in the front yard. That don't make any sense. Okay, He's going to blow over Buddy the Elf to get your attention. I'm, I'm sure he likes the movie, but still, you got to pay attention to the signs because he's not, God's an awesome God, but he's not always an obvious God. He's not always just in your face with something. Unfortunately, when he's in your face with something, most of the times that's kind of bad. You know, it's the subtle things that he gives you, just little, little bits of reassurance, just little small things. Like right now, I looked down at my wife and she's awkwardly recording me. <laughs> but she's doing that because she loves me. So that's that small little sign. Every time I look at my mom over there, she's smiling. She loves me. It's a small little sign. If we could see God's face in our life, if we could like look out those doors and see him, he'd be smiling. I, I guarantee that he would be smiling. The thing is, you have to believe that. There's nothing unbelievable about your life. Please eliminate the word. Eliminate the word. It's believable. It's believable because he made it happen. Everything goes back to it. Follow the path of anything that's happened in your life. Back to the beginning of it, and it's going to be him. The couple that could not have a child, that could not get pregnant for years and years and years, and these stories are in the Bible even, relative to today, finally they're able to have that child. And a family member says, it's unbelievable. No, it's not. You know how long we've been trying and praying? It was believable and we believed the whole time. That's why we prayed. We prayed because we believed it could happen. If we didn't believe it happened, we would stop trying and adopt it. And they still would have had a child the belief still would have came true. It wasn't God's intention for them to have a biological. It was, their intention, it was his intention to, have, to adopt one. So still, 
the belief is true. There's never a moment in our lives when unbelievable is an acceptable term to use. So if you're gonna leave with anything today from, from, from my ranting, please get it out of your system. Let that go away. There are two wolves. If anybody's heard this one, just be quiet. There's two wolves. She knows my mouth's getting dry. That's great. Oh, did you let me? One wolf is darkness and despair. The other wolf is hope and happiness. These two wolves are always fighting. I want to ask you, not a rhetorical question. If you've got an answer, I want to hear it. Which one wins? Yeah, the one you feed. Exactly. So now I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of self-reflection, a little bit of self-analyzation, but be careful because analysis can lead to paralysis. But you still need to analyze yourself. Which one are you feeding in your life? Are you feeding the hope and the happiness or are you feeding the darkness and despair? What do you do when you come home from the day? Are you making sure that your wife has a bad day too because you had one and all you're going to do is just na 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 Are you making sure your husband's going to have a bad day because you had one? You're just going to come home and na 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 Feed the happiness and the hope. I bet she looks good. Come home and tell her, hey, baby, you look good. Especially if she's cooking for you. She looks great in the kitchen. Tell her. She'll appreciate it. Tell her. Tell her how smart she is. We tell them we love them all the time. We tell them they're good looking all the time. Tell them how smart they are. Do a little bit of something different to let them know that you love them. Because God does that to us every single day. He does something different to us to let us know that he loves us. He doesn't love us the same exact way every single time. There were some races I showed you I crashed. Did God not love me that day? No. I guess he just thought I needed a concussion. <laughs> Mental adjustment. And Russ is so stubborn, I better hit him in the head pretty darn hard. So, crash. It's not always going to be roses. It's not always going to smell great. There's another one. I'm telling these stories kind of back to back pretty quickly here, but... Um, there's a pastor who walks into a barber shop. You can have a pastor walk into a bar, okay? So, pastor walks into a barber shop and he sits down and get a haircut. And the barber, unfortunately, is a cynical individual. He says, I don't know why anybody would want to be a pastor. There's no such thing as God. Bad things happen to good people. And if there was a God, bad things wouldn't happen to good people. Most of us in here have all heard that, okay? Especially as a Christian, you've heard it. The pastor decided that this is, he just came in to get a haircut. He's not going to have this discussion. He's not going to entertain this at all. So he gets his haircut, pays the gentleman, and walks out the door. But when he walks out the door across the street, he notices a homeless man. The homeless man's got long hair. He's pretty grungy. He says, sir, would you mind coming in this barbershop with me for a second? Homeless man agrees. He takes him into the barbershop. And he says, hey, hey, barber. There's no such thing as barbers. Barber can look right. What are you talking about? This guy's got long hair and he's all grungy. No such thing as barbers. And Barber kind of laughed. He goes, no, 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 sir. It's not that, that, that I don't exist. It's that he never came to see me. So if you're sitting there and you're praying, you're like, man, uh, uh, I'm not getting it. I'm not getting my prayers answered. You just ain't working in my life. You ain't doing it. Well, have you come to see him? The song talks about you looking for or, or, or us looking for him you got to understand that he's looking for you, and you need to look for him. It's a two-way relationship, and I think sometimes as Christians, we get a little caught up in waiting for him to come to us. Where's my sign? Show me, show me, show me. Well, what are you showing him? <laughs> come on, work a little bit about this relationship. It is a two-way thing. If only one of you, for those of you that are married, raise your hands, please. Raise your hands. I mean, that's the majority of the room. That's fabulous. Now, for the next two weeks, only one of you put in any effort, and let's ask the question again. <laughs> Fewer hands will go up. I hope not, actually. <laughs> but to make, this, to make my point, all right, go with me on that. you got to work at this stuff. And trust me, I'm standing up here as a divorced, remarried man, so I know. Okay? I'm not standing up here just preaching something that I've never experienced. I know it. I made my mistakes. And sometimes I make them twice. I do. And just this one, though calls me out quickly and I get to call her out too and that's what makes it fun because we understand that at the base of our relationship is love 
And me calling her out ain't going to make her love me less. She might not like me as much right then and there, but that's just fine. That's okay. We don't have to like God all the time. Because I guarantee you, he doesn't like you all the time, but he loves you all the time. And you love him all the time, and every now and then you should just tell him that. If you have a problem telling him that, some people have issues with prayer in terms of being uncomfortable or what have you, then don't pray. Just talk. Just have a conversation. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for being here and letting me have this stage and this microphone and the friendship that I forged with Dennis. Because this is amazing and I'm enjoying it and I hope they are too. Amen. It's that easy. I just did it. It's that easy. Just talk out loud. Have a conversation with the gentleman. I promise you, he'll be receptive. He may not blow up, but he may not blow Betty the Elf over right then and there, but he's going to be receptive, okay? If you've got anything going on good in your life right now, well, that's probably Jesus. If you've got anything bad going on in your life right now, well, that's probably Jesus too. The first thing that you do when you build a house is you pour foundation. We all know this, right? And my wife and I built not that long ago. There's two types of foundations, maybe, maybe more than that, but just go with me, okay? And I forget what one of them is called. If anybody in here has got it, just yell it out. But we, we, you, it's like a tension, a tension uh, thing where you put the rebar in and they twist the rebar and it makes the concrete even stronger. And I found it was odd that they made the concrete stronger by twisting the steel. By twisting something, it made it stronger. As opposed to just pouring it down and letting it dry, and concrete's hard, right? What we pour, what we, this is a cliche type of a thing, because we've all heard about the, you know, you have to, you have, to uh, you know, have a strong foundation to build a strong, uh, you know, strong anything. But what we don't talk about is that foundation, it's strong, yes, but it's also cold, and it's hard, and there's nothing that looks good about it. When you have people over to your new house, you don't show them off your foundation. You don't, like, cut a hole in the carpet and the floor and be like, look at our beautiful foundation, Nobody does that. You cover it up with nice wood floors. And you say, look at our nice wood floors. Look at our nice, beautiful carpet. Look at our nice tile. But none of that matters if you don't have the strong foundation. And, some, and, and in most cases, concrete's ugly. There's nothing attractive about that. But yet, it's the one thing that holds up your entire home. <laughs> the most unattractive thing that you don't want to talk about. Why should you? Nobody does. That's. So when I say that sometimes when bad things are happening in life, that's probably Jesus. Well, the bad thing in your life is pouring a foundation in order to make you stronger. Somebody said to me one time, not to me, actually, I was reading a, reading a book or maybe listening to a podcast. I don't remember where I heard it. It doesn't really matter. You're going to hear it now, and that's what matters. If you've got nothing bad going on in your life, you've got no stress, you've got no financial issues, everything is perfect. You probably should take a really hard look in the mirror because Satan's working in your life. Because the last thing he wants you to do is run to God. So if he can prevent problems from happening in your life, oh boy, he's going to do it. He's going to do everything in his power to make sure you don't have any issues. Because as soon as we have an issue, we run to God. As soon as we have financial problems, we pray. As soon as we have health problems, we pray. And isn't that pathetic? That as soon as we have a problem, we pray. And when everything's going great, smooth, shiny, brand new, car smells great, we don't pray. We don't pray. We probably actually naively thank him. Thank you for all this money, Lord. Well, I didn't do it. Satan did it to make sure you don't come to me. That doesn't mean if you're wealthy, <laughs> you're a sinner. So don't take it like that, okay? I think on a daily basis, we would all do ourselves a lot of favors if we recognize the things that are good, even though you did it. You did it because God gave you the ability to do so. I don't know why he did, but he gave me the ability to do this. And what I love about this photo, I'll tell a quick story about what, the Kansas race. My grandfather there on the right, give my dad a high five. Now I'm in the race car. I just went to the start finish line. So I have no idea this is happening until I saw this photo on the internet, I think, somewhere. And again, I don't know who took it. 
Um, whenever we were at Kansas in that crash I showed you in the, in the number 12 truck, I remember walking out of the infill care center <laughs> and uh, I had to go to the infill care center because I just couldn't drive my, my truck back. I wasn't hurt. Well, I found out later I had a concussion, but whatever. <laughs> that was like number six, whatever. Um, I remember walking back to the hauler, and as I'm walking back to the hauler, they're bringing the truck in uh, on the hook, you know, to to the transporter. And my grandfather's there, along with my along with my mom, and uh, and my kids were there. Uh, but my grandfather was in tears. I mean, he's holding he's holding back tears. He wasn't like boohooing, but he was holding back tears, and it confused me because I'm fine, I'm perfectly fine. I crashed, but that happens in a race. It's a risk that we take. We you know don't get if you don't want to crash, don't get on the racetrack. So it confused me, and I, I just let it go. And later on, I asked my mom, hey, why was Grandpa upset at Kansas? And he said, well, he didn't know if you'd get another opportunity, Russ. I thought he was upset because he was afraid me and I was hurt for a couple of weeks. And mom said that to me, and man, it hit me way different. Because I had the same concerns at the Daytona crash when you saw that one. I bowled my eyes out on the airplane all the way home. I, had, I went into the lavatory in the plane. I made a stupid mistake. I'm on the plane, and I, I decide to watch We Are Marshall. What am I thinking? Yeah, I was bawling my eyes out, and I'd get embarrassed, you know, and I'd go to the lavatory in the plane, and then I'm, I'm like, you know, wailing. Sir, are you okay? No. Because I didn't know I was going to get an opportunity. It was a one-race deal. That sponsor was a one-race deal. I, we had no guarantees. I didn't know. Did I, did I just blow that? Because that crash happened seven laps into the race, and we were the fastest car on the racetrack. We had the timesheet to prove it. We were going to post it, but it's too grainy. Fastest car by four-tenths of a second. My time was 186.4, and the guy behind me was 186.03 like, or something. Seven laps. I had just keyed the radio two laps prior and said, hey, guys, we've got a really fast race car. My crew chief says, okay, we'll take care of it. <laughs> Crash wasn't my fault. There was nothing I could do. But still, I didn't know if I was ever going to get another opportunity. And I bawled my eyes out because this was my dream. Gone, poof, vanished. We did, obviously, get another opportunity. So whenever I heard that story, because that, the Kansas crash happened after that one, I knew what my grandfather was feeling. And then Bristol happened, where you saw him on pit road with me. We didn't crash at Bristol, but we finished, so hallelujah. And then this happened, Talladega. And I see him high-fiving my dad. There. Thank you, God. Thank you. His concern may have been small, but for me, it meant a, a whole bunch. I didn't go into that race thinking that, you know, I need to avenge my grandfather's concern. It, it wasn't like that for me. It's just, I don't know, I saw that picture, and, and like I said, in the moment, I didn't know what happened. I'm like, man. And then the happiness on my mother's face off to the left. And guys, these are people that they look at their son, they look at their grandson like, oh my God, what is he doing? This is stupid. Why is he trying to do this? Now, they don't say these things to me. Because they love me. But you know, they're thinking it. Man, I was thinking about something whenever you were up here, Dennis, earlier, and, I, and I've forgotten what it was. But I'm going to hit on a little bit of it. So Dennis was talking, I'm going to transition, sorry. I'm, I, my segues are really bad, so just, just go with me. Um, so uh, whenever Dennis and I were younger, we were playing trumpet, um, Dennis agreed to, have, to, to, to let me give him lessons. I'm just going to say something. I'm going to make an assumption. Because he assumed I was better than him. That's why we hire somebody else to teach us to do something, whether we want to play the guitar. Uh, Tina plays the bass? You didn't tell me that last night? Holy crap, girl, that's amazing. Anyway, sorry. I'm nerding out a little bit. Okay. So first thing my wife said, Tina's playing the bass. Yes. Okay, sorry. The reason that I was so adamant with Dennis about, yes, you are, you're going to try out, yes, you are, is because I saw his talent and he didn't. And it reminded me, now I remember, I'm glad I just got to start talking. So, and I remembered something that I teach my kids all the time. Sometimes you have to believe in the belief that others have in you. 
before you can believe in yourself. I'll say it again. Sometimes you have to believe in the belief that others have in you before you can believe in yourself. Now, once you get to the point where you can believe in yourself, Katie, bar the door. When people ask me, Russ, do you think you can blah, blah, blah? I get a little offended because the first thing that hits me is, well, why couldn't I? Why wouldn't I? After the challenge has been put in front of me, the front, actually, there are challenges that put in front of myself. Nobody said, you must be a race car driver or you will perish. Nobody said that. So the challenges that I put in front of myself, I know that it's like 0.1% chance that that stuff happens. But there are 0.1% people all over the world. Why couldn't I be one of them? So whether mom and dad did a good job or a bad job raising me, I don't know. I'm going to say good, I guess, because they gave me the confidence to say that I could be a point one. I mean, they, they did a bad job by saying, Russ, if you try to be a point one, be ready to get disappointed. But they never said that to me, though. They let me practice my trumpet as much as I wanted to. And I never really asked them to annoy them. I didn't. I didn't even think about it. Mom and dad were dumb, though, when I was young. When we're teenagers, our parents are stupid. They get smarter as we get older, though. It's crazy. As soon as we have kids, like, wow. Mom and dad are way more smart now that I'm not a teenager. That was a joke, guys. Come on. You see it, right? When you're, okay, whatever. So, yeah, I, I told Dennis, you're, you're going to do this because you're really good. You're really good. It was funny that he mentioned a little, I'm sorry, I'm just on you, man. I want you in a great way, though. I love you. You know that. Um, Dennis was shy whenever he was, he, whenever he was younger. It, it, it's been absolutely, well, I can't go into that right now. Just bring me back. Bring me back to building the church. Um, uh, he was very shy. He, um, he wasn't necessarily reserved. He just, he just wasn't the one that was going to maybe sit in the front row or raise his hand first or something like that. And, and it had nothing. I, I don't know, man. Dennis was just kind of a weird cat. <laughs> yeah, and he was just weird because he was different than me. He wasn't weird. And so I saw this ability, though. I saw how good he was. And I know what a good trumpet player sounds like. I'd studied them since I was six years old. I knew that he was good. He had a great tone. He had great intonation. His articulation was great. His range was wonderful. He had passion when he played the music. When he played the music, he, was, he played it deep. He was in depth with what he did. Which is fantastic because, as he said, God is preparing him them for now. Because whenever I listen, which, by the way, the music sounds way better in person. Okay? Um, I apologize, God, for any bad thoughts I had about the musicians here. <sighs> um, <laughs> so anyway, um, you're going to do this because I believe in you more than you believe in yourself right now. And he went out and he did it. To my knowledge, you never failed. You never auditioned and weren't chosen. Every audition, you were chosen. He left out something pretty important. Well, I already said that, or he beat me. Huh. Those auditions, that was the SDA band, and that was here at Will Springs, was it not? Yeah, yeah. So, funny. That circles back around. So uh, I was talking about coming, bring, bringing me back to, to, to the church. The last 14 hours for me, we, we got into town last night at, I don't know, 4, 4, 4, 4 17. <laughs> um, and uh, at 5 o'clock we had dinner. Um, and then after dinner we went out to Dennis and Tina's home um, and just had a fabulous discussion um, and some sparkling grape juice. And the dog peed on the couch, <laughs> which evidently never happens. But I reached down to pet the little puppy, and <laughs> Dennis is like, well, I guess we're going to sit at the dining room table now because we can't sit on the couch. So, sorry about that. I guess I scared the pee out of the dog. I don't know. Um, <laughs> man, that's Dennis, though. That's his whole life. Yeah, I didn't know he caught a forest on fire, though. Um, it's been so 
Humbling is the wrong word because I think when, some, I think when people are humbled, that, they, that, that means they didn't expect that to happen. And so they're humbled by that. They're humbled by the expectation uh, being greater than or less than what actually happened. But when, when I asked Dennis, like maybe five minutes into dinner, because it had been just tearing at me and I wanted to ask him in person, tell me the story. How did you, how did you become a pastor of a church? Because I know the trumpet player, Dennis, and the musician, Dennis, and now we're... And our priest in the church and tell me, I missed a, I missed a lot. Catch me up. I won't go through that story because y'all lived it. When we walked in here after dinner on the way out to their place, we walked in here. Dennis and I standing right there. This is nothing compared to what he did for you, for God. This inspires people that I have no clue. This inspires people that I never get to talk to. This inspires people that actually are only inspired out of, um, not jealousy, but admiration. That's the word. They're inspired out of admiration. Boy, I wish I could do that. We'll stop wishing and start getting up your butt and go do it then. I mean, that's my, done, you know. Put the mic down. That's all I got to say about that. But the faith that he had to have in himself and Tina and Tina had to have in him and in you guys as a congregation and the sacrifices and the other people that stepped into his life that helped him out and the timing of those people presenting themselves to him in his life to make this happen. This is week after week after week. Guys, I haven't raced since I think 2016. So that, that, that's done and gone. And when I, and what, and when I was... I wasn't as close to God then as I am now. Overwhelming the last 16 hours for me has been to walk through those doors and say, my friend in high school did this. And he has given me the honor to speak to his congregation who on a weekly basis he brings closer to Christ. So if today... You perhaps don't have anything to thank, be thankful for. Thank him for your church. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't want this to be a show of hands, but I, I would be afraid to ask how many of you thank God for your church. I'd be afraid to ask that question. And in your own minds right now, you have your answers. And some of you have no problem with your answers, and some of you should have a great problem with your answers. Not because of his sacrifices or Tina's or his family. It has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with being thankful. Okay, he was chosen to do this. Your thankfulness comes from your existence because you were chosen to be a part of it. You were chosen to walk through the door. You were chosen to be here in Will Springs at this point in your life for whatever reason that is. You were chosen for that. My wife last night. How, how much time? Where am I going here? Oh, okay. Okay. Sun's still up here. (laughs) It's not the crowds I'm used to. All out. Um, Last night, whenever we we left dinner, we came here first uh, before we went out to the house. And um, Nadia, Nadia's my wife. I don't think I even said her name. Sorry. My beautiful wife, Nadia. My mother, Elaine, next to her. Two most important women in my life. My third most important woman is my daughter. She's home. Um, got to be careful talking about family and get all verklempt. So, Nadia says, Russ, is it humbling to know that, you know, you're kind of coming back to your roots to speak? I hadn't thought about it. So in that moment, I had to, I had to think about it. I said, no, I don't, it's not humbling for me. That humbling is the wrong word. For me, it's a reminder of where the passion came from. Because I'm going to say some stuff here, so don't take me wrong. And also, please remember, I'm an 18-year-old idiot, all right, at this moment in time. I hated where I was. I wanted to get out of Mountain Grove so bad. It didn't have anything for me. Everything that I wanted, everything that was in within me, spiritual, musically, everything that I wanted, selfishly, was not there. And I wanted out. I wanted out so bad that when I graduated, I didn't throw my hat in the air. I just walked off the football field. I went home. I told you, please don't judge me. I was an 18-year-old jerk, all right? 
And I wasn't celebrating that moment. I didn't care about that moment. What I cared about was the moments that I knew were ahead of me. There's a part of that that's inspirational, and there's a part of it that I would not advise. Because you need to enjoy the moments that are before you, whether you think you have something better for you in the future or not. Just enjoy that moment where you are right now, because that's what God's giving you. He puts you there right now. Throw your hat in the air. Celebrate with your friends, because you all accomplished this together. Not a regret, but I would do it different. So it wasn't humbling. It was a reminder to come back here, be in a town that I competed with Dennis, got my butt beat by Dennis. Because this is where the passion came from. This is where the spark was ignited. The word passion, so we got two words today, right? One's un- unbelievable, which we're going to eliminate that. The word passion, from now on, whenever you say that word, or you hear that word, I want you to automatically think of another word, because the word passion means sacrifice. You guys knew that, right? The word passion means sacrifice. Passion of Christ. We weren't talking about his inspiration to hang on the cross. We are talking about the passion of Christ to... It's his sacrifice. So if you're going to be passionate about something, well, that means you're willing to sacrifice something. So what I was willing to sacrifice in the moment of me being selfish and wanting to get out of Mountain Grove because it had nothing for me because I knew that there were other things for me somewhere else was a sacrifice. Because I'm sure my mom and dad weren't excited. Maybe not. Maybe they were excited to have me go. I don't, I don't know. I cost them a lot of heart I can pay. <laughs> my mom great overnight. I turned 16, boom, next morning, great. <laughs> Yeah, we did some stupid stuff. That's how we started this thing. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Jeff Walker should be listening later today. I'm not going to tell the whole story. But Den- Dennis and Jeff and I, when I say we did some stupid stuff, I'll just highlight. We, uh, we backed a car up a tree. Crashed. Totaled it. We gave Dennis poison ivy from head to toe. Missed school for about two weeks. Had to take oatmeal baths. So when I say we did some stupid stuff, we did some stupid stuff. Okay, we came out of my house one time. Dennis's car was gone. <laughs> he left it out and got a gear and it rolled down the hill. And had, to, had to pull it out with my dad's Ford Ranger. Smoked the clutch in it. Mom and dad were asleep, thank God. <sighs> we got... My mom and dad didn't know about that. Right, Yeah. <laughs> Well, we pulled it. His car was fine. We pulled it out. It was all good. With the clutch in my dad's truck, ooh, not so much. Not so much. Yeah. Isn't it funny, though? Isn't it funny how, I mean, we come out and we look at the car. The car's gone. Oh, my gosh, what happened? Somebody steal it? No, it's Mount Grove. It's Mount Grove in 1992 or something, you know, so. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, don't, don't forget that when you're passionate about something, it means you're willing to sacrifice it. And if you hear somebody say, man, I'm just really passionate about this. Because sometimes they use passion as an excuse. What are you doing that for? I'm just passionate about it. Oh, are you? Let's see. Let's see how passionate you are. Okay? Because that Kansas race that I crashed at, let's see how passionate you are. Let's see how much you're willing to sacrifice. Because I was racing full time. I had taken the leap and I quit my job. And the account was in a negative balance. And if I didn't make the race, I didn't get paid. I had to make the race. And of course, with NASCAR, you, they pay positions in the truck series 1 through 36. So I knew, I just need to finish the darn race, but I have to be in it before I can finish it. There's a lesson there, too. We'll come back. <laughs> and when I crashed, although it was heartbreaking and I hated it, oh, my God, at least I'm getting paid. Thank you. Because we're in a world of hurt. So, Russ is off gallivanting, living his dreams. Oh, is he, though? Would you do that? Would you quit your job and have a negative bank account just to go out there in the NASCAR Camp World Truck Series where there's all these great, wonderful people and the names that you see and that you know and say, I'm going to beat you? (laughs) Because if I don't, I go broke. I go bankrupt. I can't support my wife and my children. 
I have to do this. Now, what's both magical and crappy about that is it's magical that I had the courage that God gave me the courage to go do that. And it's also crappy that I did that. (laughs) Because risks sometimes are worth it and sometimes they're not. But you don't know until you take them. So if you're on that cusp or your children are on that cusp and they want to go out there and they want to go take that risk and they want to become a professional singer, then maybe they should go take the risks that they're uncomfortable with. Because I can guarantee you, you're going to find out one of two things. You're going to find out that either God wanted that for you or he didn't. But in your quest to get there, you found the place that God wanted you to be. But because you decided to stay home and do nothing and maybe give up because it was a little bit hard. And, 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 and the voice has an awkward way of trying out online. And it's a little bit complicated. You decided no. So you have no idea what God really has intended for you. Musician to musician. That's why I'm picking on you, brother. Go do it. Go do it, whatever it is. A career, a business, a family, a woman that you see every day at the coffee shop, the donut shop, wherever. And you don't talk to her because her beauty is that intimidating. Go talk to her. Buy her freaking coffee. Buy her the donut. Whatever. Whatever. Go do it. Maybe she'll say no. But in that no, she'll go to her friend at work and say, hey, that guy that I always see at the coffee shop, he asked me out today. Oh, did he? Ha, 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 ha. What did you tell him? I told him no. Well, is he cute? Well, yeah, he's not bad. Well, introduce me. And there we go. Isn't it funny how the no's lead to where you're supposed to be? It's not always the yes that means it was God. The yes can sometimes be be the devil just making you get further and further and further away. I'll tell you yes. I'll I'll grant that prayer. Yes, you bet. You bet. I'll do it. And before you know it, you're so far off center that you're about to fall off. Stay centered. I tell my kids that all the freaking time. Stay centered. Stay centered in Christ. Stay centered in your life. Stay centered in your aspirations, your goals. Whatever it is that you're doing, stay centered. And if you make somebody mad on the left, you make somebody mad on the right, then you do. And you address that whenever you need to. But right now, you're going to stay centered. And you're going to do what's good for you. Because what's good for you is good for the people that you love. And if they love you the way God loves you, or even close, they're going to understand that what you're doing, that sacrifice, that craziness, gives them that memory. Because my mom has that memory. She probably remembers when that picture was taken. Not that she saw the photographer, but she knows. Emotionally, she knows. Emotionally, I know. If that's my dad, he would know, and I know my grandfather would know as well. So in those moments, I don't ask you, I beg you to get rid of the word unbelievable, to say you believe, to act like you believe, okay? And stay centered. And remember that if you or somebody you love is passionate about something and they need to be called out, then you call them out and say, then what are you willing to sacrifice? Because in and of itself, the word passion is sacrifice. Because if you stay comfortable, you're just staying with, with the devil as far as I'm concerned. Greatness is found in people that are uncomfortable. Everybody that achieves something, they were uncomfortable. You think I'm comfortable strapping into a race car? No, every time the wind's fired up, I need to pee. Every time. Every single time. And no, I never pee in my fire suit. Okay, get that out there. I know drivers that puked, but not me. Or peed, not me. Or number two, just... Some of you are thinking it. I'm, I'm trying to wrap up here, okay? My kids, they, they, whenever we have... My, man, I... God is an intense God, yes? Louder, yes? Okay, so why shouldn't you be? You're creating his image and his likeness. He's put you here for a specific reason, so go find the specific reason. If you have found it right now, if you're living it, and you're living it in peace, and you know, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, then do it better. Do it so good that you inspire the next person to do it. I found it a little bit ironic in the stories that Dennis told last night that the pastors that he spoke to, whenever he said that he was building a church, the pastors that he spoke to said he was crazy. But those are the pastors that believe in the same God that you do. Why do they think that's crazy? Because God hadn't blessed them with the courage that he blessed Dennis with. That's why they think he's crazy. 
So if God has blessed you with the courage to do something that's just crazy, know that you're doing it because of what God has blessed you with. Man, I had something else. I was, was going to be a good closer. And yeah, I don't remember what that was. I was talking about my kids, though, and telling them about the intensity, though, you know, living the life. I guess I'll just leave you with something that a professor, a college professor of mine said once. His name is Mr. Bright, a, a fantastically wonderful man. Love him to death. He, made, he changed me a lot throughout college. Um, this is a touchy one. If somebody doesn't have anything to do with your immediate success or failure... Why do you care? Why do you care what they think? If somebody doesn't have anything to do with your immediate success or failure, why do you care? Maybe it's a message best made for the younger people, but I think the older people can find some, find some uh, value in that as well. Because I found a lot of value in it, and I've never forgotten it, and I was told that, I think, 19 years old. 48 now. <laughs> There's no, sorry. <laughs> Beginning and. Man, I guess that's just about it. I, thank you guys for letting me talk to you. Thank you so much. Dennis, thank you. Hey, Amen. Enjoy that. I guess by the round of our pause, I'd say that you did. Hey, Amen. I like that. You know, we talk about, as, as Christians, one quick trip through the Bible, and you can tell there's an awful lot of unbelievable things that God wants us to believe. Amen? That by man's standards, we, 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 we set ourselves apart as believers. There's really only two kinds of people in the world. There's believers and unbelievers, right? And that God would call us, I like it, man. I'm, I, I'm eliminating, I'm going to do my best to eliminate the word unbelievable out of my vocabulary. Because I have seen God do so many things in my life personally, not just through me, but in me. I mean, there's no reason why I should stand up here and no reason why any of us should still be here. And to know, to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God loves me, um, I, I, and me believing that is what salvation is all about. Amen? God says, I believe you, and I proved it by sending my son to die on the cross for you. Is that believable to you, or is it unbelievable? Right? If it's unbelievable, I can't believe that God would do that, then salvation is outside our grasp. But when we say, I believe that God did that, I believe that there's a lot of evidence. We sing that song about evidence. God brings us to faith, not really not through blind faith in which we just have to kind of grab something from the air. The Bible says that, that faith is the evidence of things hoped for, right? The evidence of things not seen. God says, I will, I will show myself to you in no uncertain terms, day by day by day. I like what he said at the very beginning of this is that when that God is showing himself, he's showing uh, his love to us, um, and the question is, are we seeing it, right? Not to re-preach his message here this morning, but I just want to think, you know, our, our minds, a lot of times I think folks that we, we miss out on what God's wanting to do in our life because our, our minds aren't right. Anybody else have a problem with their mind besides me? Yeah. Our, our minds are like runaway, runaway trains and our minds aren't right. And sometimes these good reminders, like what Russ has shared with us today, um, the reminders to get our mind right, how we think about things matter. I mean, it really does. How we think about God, um, his passion for us, his sacrifice for us, how we think about that matters. How we think about other people, um, not, how, not how they think about us, I like that, but how we think about other people, that other people matter, um, but ultimately how we think about ourselves and what we think God can do in us and through us. So I encourage you to take this, man, take this, um, these thoughts that he brought to us today and apply it. In, in every aspect of your life, because it, it matters. Here's the thing, and I'll, I'll say this. We have a tendency sometimes to put God in our church box, right? That we want, this is what we think about God right here in, in our, on Sunday morning when we go to church. But what God wants us to do is think about him and how he applies to every aspect of our life. God is in our job. God is in our home. God is in our family. And don't separate him. Don't try to separate him um, from you know, in, in certain boxes of your life, let him have full and complete reign in every aspect of your life.